Good morning, Vietnam. It's me. Wow, look at that. I'm so tired. I could have yawned straight into the mic. <laughs> I feel like I'm just like extraordinarily lethargic these past two days. Try and make the old brain kick, and kick into overgear. It's not quite working out. But we're getting there. We'll all make it. Oh no, this is not what I want to listen to. And also, my liquor. Go buy more liquor. Ugh. Didn't realize it, but I was actually like ultra low. <sighs> That's fine. It's probably better for my liver, anyways. What's today? Is it a Wednesday? It is a Wednesday. That's fine. <laughs> it's still also very hot outside. Like, temperature-wise, it's only in the 80s, but in terms of how it feels to go outside, it's absolutely horrible because of the humidity. It's like stepping into a sauna. Uh, I've been a, I've been in a, a real sauna before and, like, a super scuffed wilderness sauna. Where the you know the real sauna you know, has the 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 wood furniture, the little brazier that you can splash water on, and then the the wilderness sauna was like a little I don't want to say wigwam. It's like a what the heck is a wigwam by the way. Actually, you know what? It one hundred percent was a wigwam. I should have went with my gut. <laughs> it was a wigwam. Except like instead of being constructed mostly out of like thatch and reeds, it was constructed out of like canvas. Canvas and like flexible wooden branches. Oh, now that was an experience. Because of how um Because of how you had to get to the wilderness sauna. It meant that like everyone is like just super dirty, right? So we're just covered in dirt. We've been hiking for I think it was ten days. We've only had a chance to wash up once, and that was three days into the trek. So we've been a, we've been a week without like a proper shower. Well, actually, that's not true. We've been a week, 10 days without a proper shower. We did have one point in time where there was like a creek. But, so we were able to do like a, an okay kind of navy shower where you just take a rag and wipe yourself down. Otherwise, water was also hard to come by because we were hiking out in the desert as well. This was in... What's the one next to Arizona? New Mexico. New Mexico. And it was part of a res. A reservation. An Indian, American Indian reservation. I'm still somewhat unclear on to what the proper terminology is. It's like, in school, we we're told to call them Native American. Yeah, Native Americans. But now, I've also seen it kind of come back around or loop back around to just being called, like, American Indians. I don't know. Well, the explanation where, you know, calling them Indians again was they're both arbitrary names. <laughs> and so some people, some, some um, natives of the North American continents prefer just the first name. Otherwise, it's like, you know, whitewashing twice. Something like that.
Mm. But anyways, yeah, it was it was super gross, but also just extraordinarily intense as well since it was such a small wigwam. And so when you're sitting there, you're sweating just out of every pore. And that was also my first experience in a sauna as well. And like all saunas, it's also like extremely homoerotic <laughs> since it's all basically a bunch of dudes in their underwear, crouching around like a brazier, occasionally dumping water on it. I remember it was shocking to me the first time I was like which is barely staying conscious looked at my arm and which completely terrified because my arm had turned into like a, a it looked like it was like expelling black liquid from it. I was like, oh my god am I dying <laughs> but no that was just like the the dirt in my pores being like forcibly pushed out and then since we're not moving, it just kind of pools on your arm. Extremely gross. I don't know why I keep looking at this, by the way. So there's the model config. What changed here? So get uh. All right, just took out the region. That's fine. And some unused config values. Hmm, get stage. I think that makes sense, actually. I'm gonna look at puppet. No, not puppet trait, runner trait. So is this a, oh, this isn't even a model. That's true. This isn't even used. So we should be taking this out. So something I was thinking about doing actually was instead of working on the stage stuff today, I'm gonna turn on a fan really quick. The duck really looks like one of those kind of rubber chickens that makes the elongated vertical ones. When I step away, but I'm still visible in the background. Okay. But here, here's what I was thinking. Since we don't have as much time today, because I always I do start later on Wednesdays. me think. I mean, it's probably fine. All of these are probably fine, and then the... Uh, let's, let's finish the stage stuff. <laughs> let's finish the stage stuff. Hmm. Let me think. I, I'm thinking I don't actually want to do this stuff. What we can do is... If it's a resource, we can iterate over the properties contained within. So we can do for prop in item get property list. If prop name in globals ignored properties. And I think I do want to make a distinction between like reference properties and resource properties. So pretty much the only difference is that this would be like resource properties or ignored resource properties. Ignored resource properties. And so then this would be basically the same thing. Oh, hello, hello. What made you want to make a VTuber app? So the impetus for making this and this was I was looking at a, a news report about the top earning channels on YouTube. And I was like, oh, you know what? <laughs> it, it, I think at the time it was like three out of the five like top earningest and out of the, it was like, like six out of 10, top, six out of the top 10 
top earning channels on YouTube by ad revenue or like donation revenue were VTubers. And I was like, really? <laughs> like I, I had known beforehand, like, oh, yeah, there's, there's virtual characters and people play them, but they can't possibly be that lucrative, right? And it turns out they are that lucrative. So I looked into the, the programs they're using, and it looked like most of them were closed source or like proprietary, right? Which makes sense. I was like, all right. Are there any open source ones? And the only open source one I could find was V Magic Mirror. So I was like, eh. one, it's in Unity, and two, uh, eh. <laughs> I, it's not the. It also has a proprietary full version that you can't look at. And of course, Unity has its like own special way of doing things. And also it's in Japanese. So I decided to make my own. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I just wanted to look at how it worked. There was no way to look at how it worked, so I decided to do it myself. And here we are, uh, about a year later, about to get this release off the ground. Well, it's already in alpha, right? So you can go to here. This is just the splash screen. You can click past it. Look at that. So there is an alpha, uh, which means that it's not actually feature complete. There are bugs, but in theory, most of most most of the menu stuff is there. It's just not implemented yet, like this props. There's nothing in props, so we're still working on that. But you know, you have all the options, blah blah, you know presets, you can switch to different models, you can hide, you can start the tracker. I'm not going to start the tracker again because the tracker doesn't work uh, when working from two applications. Oh. Yeah. That's pretty much it. I was annoyed because there is no open source options, but now there are like a, a pretty decent amount of open source options now. Well. For VRM, there's actually still not that much, surprisingly. If you wanted something that can do live 2D, which is the, you know, 2D, it's in the name. So I suppose I should show off the fact that this supports VRM models. Look at that. You gotta wait for it. This one is still sort of scuffed. Don't know why, but it happens. Yeah. So this does support 3D models, how nice. Uh, but if you want like a live 2D viewer, there are a few open source options that have been around. And I know that there is also a, a free and open source variant of live 2D that has also had preliminary releases called Enochi 2D. How nice. Let's configure. All right, let's. Replace that. So ignored reference properties. Ah, it's not how you do it at all. Hit up the old find and replace. I think this makes sense to split these up. So it should be ignored resource properties. Hmm. All right, so for prop and, and blah, blah, blah. So world is a, oh, actually this should be item dot environment because it is a world object. Yeah, and then you attach a world resource to your viewports, which is how this application works. Uh, which is how the screenshots are generated at runtime, is that it, this thing is actually run in a sub viewport, so a camera within your camera. Something like that, that's, that's the, <laughs> the closest approximation I have, which is gonna be used on Windows for Spout 2 support, so you can GPU texture share without the UI to like OBS or whatever. Uh, learning rigging in Live 2D recently is a bit of a steep learning curve. Mmm, I hear. 
I think any of the, the live 2D stuff or Enochi 2D, so if you're interested in what I'm talking about there, Enochi 2D, this is what I'm talking about. So this has support for models like this. And I, I think it, it uses a very, very similar rigging style as Live 2D, but because it's not copied from the source code, it's valid. <laughs> But yeah, I think that stuff is actually slightly more involved than making 3D models. Because if you're trying to approximate a, a 3D model in 2D is actually very difficult. Hmm. Let's wrap all this stuff. What am I doing? Hmm. <laughs> so this gives you the entire list. So you have your world. Then you'll also have your V box. Still can't type today. All right, so we'll move all this stuff here, basically. So for prop in world environment get property list get prop name in ignored resource properties we'll just continue okay but so we'll just have to think about that yeah i don't actually do any of my own rigging for vr and stuff by the way i mostly just because there's a lot of tooling around it but there is a way to do it manually I know some people who do it manually, which is absolutely wild as well. So I, I think there is someone on my Discord who has used the actual kind of manual export step where you can tweak all the parameters, which is, I think, slightly optimal. All right, so let me think. I think we'll need to match on every single property type. So this will be, <laughs> so item is equal to, ba, ba, ba. let's actually pull out the environment, I suppose. So var in V is some sort of environment, world environments, just so it's slightly more ergonomic to access. So env get prop name where property get property list gives you an array of dictionaries which contains information about every single one of the objects uh, properties obviously hmm and then we'll just match um, type of item. So there are several types that we want to handle. I've already kind of like written it out manually, but then I kind of realized, oh, like, what am I stupid? Let's not do it like that. So Godot environment box. So there's, we don't want to handle texture. We don't want to handle well, we only want to handle basic variables. I think vector three is a little tough. Color, doable. Actually, the enums are, are doable as well. I would just need to find out which enum they're associated with. And that's fine, actually. <laughs> Most of these are floats. So handle type real. We want to handle type int. And then here we'll just add a, a to do. To do enums are also technically ints. So I'll need to think about how to handle those. Might just have to handle those as an edge case. And actually, I should be, I should also break this out. Handle 
property. And then this will return some sort of control object depending on the type of the property. So there's floats, there's ints, there's colors. Um, anything else I will not support. Or it will just have to be handled as an edge case. So some sort of property. And beyond that, we have no idea. So this is uh, duck typing. Oh, no. And so, yeah, OK. Match type of property. We'll call it prop, just to be consistent with my naming scheme. Prop. Sorry, I'm typing very slowly today as well. <laughs> Type, type color, and then the various vector two thingies also need to be handled somehow. Let me see, camera, just pull that up beforehand. And then also, what was the last thing? Uh, lights, that's right. So there's all types of lights that can be used. But this one's also fairly easy. Oh, then there's also bools. Right, 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 right. Bools are easy. Vector two. And none of these except arrays, so that's fine. Type. Vector three. And then, <laughs> I suppose anything else will just have to return something. Oh, I'm doing this on the wrong thing. Hey. So, ba ba ba. There's your error. So, return null. Oh no. <laughs> you hate to see that. So, type real. <laughs> so this will be some sort of property. Hmm. So control is equal to handle property. And then we just need to check if it's null or not. I generally dislike returning null. Eh. But I think in this one instance, it's OK. <laughs> in this one instance, it's fine. As long as we're cognizant of the fact that it could be null. If control is null, then we'll just continue. Don't do anything. That's fine. So here, for type real, <laughs> type real, type int. I think these can be handled kind of in the same step. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, these can be handled in the same step. Because there's not really a specific type of special handling I had in mind for those. So this will be var hbox. Some sort of HBox container. So we'll just generate these at runtime. Control till h expand fill this HBox. Then we'll have a some sort of label for it. How fancy? How does he think of these names? Oh. Okay, so I think this does need to. We do need to pass in the actual name as well. OK. So there's the actual property, which is the explicit value. And then we'll also have to have the prop name associated with it. So this is some sort of string. Uh, so we'll pass in prop name. And then there's no other information that really needs to be associated with it. 
So control till h expand fill label. Let me see. Yeah, we'll add it, but we also need to do label text is equal to prop name hbox add child label bar text edit. What am I doing? Control util h expand fill. And then the text edit. Text needs to be a string representation of whatever the prop is. And then I think we'll just return the H box. That's fine. My favorite Smash player. So B box. Add child. Control. It's beautiful. Easy. Um, now we just need to do, the, <laughs> do it for every single other one. So this one I think is fairly easy. This one is going to be a check button. Uh, I prefer to just call the variable whatever the class is supposed to be. But if I was feeling lazy, I could just call it like I or something. But it doesn't hurt to be a little bit more verbose. Because honestly, I don't even read the entire function anyways. I just kind of skim it. I'm at that point in my life where I, I don't know, I don't really read the code anymore. I just kind of look at how it's structured. And from that, I can kind of glean like, OK, does this feel right? I don't know. Maybe. Hard to say. All right, color. This needs to be a color picker. So more code, the, like the, the, the slow part about programming isn't the typing part, 100%. Although I think that's what a lot of people think is the, the slow part about programming is like, oh no. You know, you wanna minimize as much typing as possible. And that's not true. You wanna minimize the amount of reading you have to do. <laughs> which is, to be fair, still related to how much stuff is you know, slapped into this kind of stuff, right? The more text equals, in general, the amount of reading you have to do. But I think most people, you kind of get a sense for how code flows together at some point. So you don't actually read the entire thing anymore anyways. Like the matrix, I don't even see. The major, I don't even see the code, just see blonde, brunette, redhead. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of where it, it, it's like at the time when I watched the movie, I was like, that sounds so dumb. There's no way that's actually true, right? And uh, let me tell you, it is 100% true. Like, it's, it's something that's hard to explain to people or to non-programmers is like, what do you mean you don't even like see the code anymore? <laughs> like, isn't that just like a movie quote? I mean, and yeah, it is a movie quote, but also it's like, for me, at least for me, everyone has their own kind of style of doing it, but like I prefer to have a very descriptive function name and we're like just a function header basically. So I, I only read this part I read maybe like the first one or two lines and then I read the end of it. <laughs> Everything else I just kind of like, eh, yeah, it looks about right, you know. You know, if I read the first line as a match, if, you know, everything inside of this better be a match statement that has returns inside of it, you know, or if it's like something like light page. Okay, so we're generating a light page. And it's, okay, yeah, looks like this is all generating light page stuff and then Hopefully we are returning something and looks like we're not because we're actually adding this straight to the VBox. Okay, that checks out. I don't even read all this middle stuff. You know, I just kind of trust that I'll catch it in testing. 
Which is why this is also one of the first big programs I worked on that has integrated testing. Oh, yeah, look at that. 234 tests passed. Oh, baby. Of course, this, uh, all the tests don't really cover this UI stuff, unfortunately. It's all the stuff backing the UI. I'm still thinking about how to do UI testing. Oh, there we go. I think handle world, that's probably fine. Handle color pick, no. Or connect color picker, yeah, whatever. So handle camera. Or maybe this should be called handle resource, and then these other ones are like handle spatial. Yeah, this should be handle resource. Because we don't really, uh, no. Uh, no, handle world needs to be special. Because we need to go inside of the world to get the environments. Or maybe it should just be like handle environment, not handle world. Like there's no reason for us to handle the entire world. It should just be a handle environment, yeah. So ENV. So professional. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, it's professional, right? I actually, te you know, in my, my actual job, my day job, if you will, I don't even do any testing at all. Like our testing is essentially just run it. If it works, it works. <laughs> so actually in my side projects, I do way more testing. We'll debug, yeah, we'll, we'll write tests later or tests at least for like a, from a project management point of view. You know, if your project manager is not a programmer, you know, tests actually contributes basically nothing, right? It's like, it's hard to measure the value of, you know, scoping out time, allocating time to write tests, which is very unfortunate, which is why a good project manager is hopefully someone who is actually technical. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. in most circumstances. Which is actually somewhat surprising, right? Because a project manager gets paid about the same as a, as a, um, what do you call it? A programmer. Well, I think they get paid, yeah, they get paid about the same. I mean, there's less project managers, obviously, but one, they don't do like any programming. They just kind of, from what I understand, like manage timelines and the budget. <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh yeah, timelines, yes. So because of the timeline thing, right? It's hard to allocate time for tests because tests, or I suppose handling errors, preventing errors only prevents like, negative work, I suppose. That's a good way of describing it. So the more time, if you have a bug that adds work to the already kind of like scoped out work. So your scope increases for every like, every time you have to handle a bug, it increases the scope of the project. That's basically it. But if you can just avoid bugs, <laughs> yeah, just, just write good code forehead, you know? Um, then you don't need to write tests, and th thus you save a bit of time. Very hard to quantify the value, yeah. Which is why it's better just to like allocate time for writing tests beforehand, right? But I think if you're trying to squeeze, you know, uh, as much work into as little time as possible, tests are generally the first one to get cut. You know, I don't agree with it, but that's just how it happens. You know, I don't make the rules. And I also don't write the contracts, so. <laughs> 
You know what? I think I can totally make this ultra generic. Because this is the this is the exact same code, just with a different thing here. Hmm. Okay, hold on. <laughs> so now that I've written this twice, now I can just do handle where it's like creates elements. Something like that. So we'll always take in a V box. See, this is my ideal way of programming, by the way. So some sort of object. It'll always be some sort of object. And then we'll do for prop pin object. By the way, completely out of the blue, apropos of nothing at all. Let me see, does my bot work? My bot does work. The container didn't crash a few streams in a row. But this is actually not stream avatars. Look at that. You can randomize it. That can be a poop. You can type in a custom command <laughs> if you know what they are to make yourself upside down. Everything's just written in Gideo. Yeah, property list. But yeah. My typing speed has slowed way down uh, entirely because of how I like them. The, the keyboards I usually use are all broken. I'm very sad. I thought it was because the boards shorted out, but I, I was, you know, I was made a post on Reddit and people say like, have you checked, like you should one, check to see if there's like, the boards are actually shorted out or if it's just like the connector, the USB connector that went bad. You know, that makes sense. Cause the, the USB connectors on the, both my usual keyboards are just kind of hanging off the PCB. So, eh, you know what? Maybe I should do that. <laughs> I'm not too much of a hardware guy, but my, my dad is actually a hardware guy. My dad actually hates the fact that I'm a programmer, even though I'm not, that's not actually my job title. <laughs> I'm a software consultant. I'm actually supposed to mostly just be talking about it, but here we are. How do you find GD scripts? I, I like GD scripts for scripting. Definitely. GDScript definitely has a lot of drawbacks. So for example, everything is just in, so it, all GDScript classes are globally namespaced, which is a huge pain. And actually something that people don't realize is that every single class is stored here, which is just a boggling decision, I think. <laughs> It kind of it kind of shows you that like GD scripts having class names or GD script being used for like really really big projects is kind of an afterthought. Weirdly enough, it's like you you were actually meant to use like C plus plus right write a C plus plus module recompile the engine and then use GD script for scripting. But here we are. I have been writing GD or C plus plus modules for this though. Uh, and I think the, the plan is for now, uh, for the Godot 3 version of this application, we'll keep it as pretty much, uh, most things are still going to be in GD scripts. Like all these scenes are all hot loaded. So they're ro loaded at runtime, which is a benefit of GD scripts. But I think I'm going to be moving more and more things out to C++ in the future which does make it harder for contributors to get started, but it's, it's just too difficult <laughs> with these ultra big code bases to only use GD scripts. You try C Sharp, didn't they add it recently? Yeah, C Sharp has been in Godot since like 2018. So yeah, I, I've used C Sharp. I'm not a huge fan of Godot C Sharp. Although it is pretty fast and also has a really good namespace support. I just, I don't know. <laughs> it's like if I'm already using another language, like I'd rather just write Rust, which is actually how some of the, the what, what, what do you call it? Lip syncing, yeah. The lip syncing works is I wrote a pretty much my own lip sync implementation, uh, ported from someone else's, of course, uh, in Rust and then connected that 
you know? So if we're going to be diving down, we might as well dive down to like a really low level language. <laughs> like really the only thing that I'm, the only things that I'm missing from GD scripts are uh, one actual error handling. So here you can see that I'm returning a result. This is one of my C++ additions. It's a native class. Uh, so you can wrap values, you can unwrap values. It's very, very Rust syntax inspired. So here we always return safely okay. So there's a bit of overhead, which is unlike how try catch works. Try catch, from what I understand, at least in a Java context, has no overhead, but it also prevents optimizations. So you can, you know, handle the exception, right? So try catch is something that I'm missing, but they're not going to implement it. And then just, as I said before, like namespacing classes or just better class support. Handle property, prop name. And then this is object get <laughs> prop name. No, you must have a lot of spare time. Not really. <laughs> Not really. I just like programming. Because as mentioned before, I am like a programmer, or essentially a programmer in my day job. So I, you know, I also try to stream one, two, three, four, five, four, four. <laughs> one plus three is four uh, times a week for about you know three or four hours every single session. So that is, what is four times four? 16, 16 hours a week on side projects. And I, you know, I also just work on this off stream as well sometimes. Go through the fun parts of my side projects and they get left by the wayside. Yeah, I mean, I also have a lot of side projects, right? So if you go to my GitHub, try catch still has the overhead of the exceptions of, yeah, yeah, but the, the try block itself has no overhead besides the implicit over, it's not, impl yeah, kind of implicit overhead of no optimizations. Yeah, look at this, I have 132 repositories. <laughs> look at that. And most of them are actually Godot related as well. Some of them are C++ stuff. Some of them are Rust. It is beautiful. Oh, hello, Demuriel, hello, hello. Handle, what is it called? Ha create elements. Create elements. So we'll pass in the V box, pass in item environment, and then also pass in globals. Ignored resource properties. Yeah. It's beautiful. Look at that. So just take this out. Now I just need to grab a list of all the spatials that, well, all the spatial properties that should be ignored. What, what's the, which Spider-Man movie is that quote from? Yeah, I'm son, something of a scientist myself. Uh, that's not even close to his, <laughs> his voice. It's kind of sad how he, that actor always gets typecast into the, like a villain role, right? I'm very bad with names. All right, so let me see. So that's a resource new. I think here I want to do a spatial new. This will leak actually, hold on. Bar spatial equal spatial new. So this is my scratch file or scratch project, shall we say. Spatial. Spatial. And then spatial. All right. So that'll take a little bit and we'll look at. What are the things that don't need to be here? Oh, I forgot. Oh, good. Okay, so this should be reference. 
reference, and then this, we should take out the this thing. Okay, that makes more sense. So ignore spatial properties, drag this up on my top screen. Look at how many screens I have. Okay, so node. Editor description, don't need that. Editor description. I actually typed the I as I pr pronounced it as well. Uh, import path. Can't type still. Man, the, it's weird. Like, I, I kind of, I still really like this old kind of old Apple II keyboard layout. It is taking me longer than I would like to reteach myself how to use it, though. So there's name, file, oh. Yeah, we don't want name, we don't want file name. Owner, multiplayer. Oh, I always forget how many, like, this is why nodes or using nodes for everything in Godot is just a horrible idea. Look at all this, all this extra crufts a node has. Like it's nice, it makes it easy because everything behaves the same. You can depend on a shared set of functionality across all nodes, but also all nodes have this functionality, <laughs> which makes them somewhat slow compared to just doing it in like a, a pure fashion. I don't really have a good word for it. Transform, global transform. Actually, global transform, you do want to hand, hold on to that. Global transform, translation, yep. Rotation, degrees, rotation, scale, matrix, you don't want that. Actually, you do want the matrix. Matrix do you want to avoid? <laughs> I think these are like editor hints. What the heck? Because this doesn't actually correspond to a property. Gizmo, nope. And then script, no. Gizmo, and I'm assuming there's script property somewhere, or is that not true? Hmm. Yeah, game object syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, you just got to be careful about talking to or mentioning to other Godot hobbyists about not doing everything with nodes. It'll get you shunned. Like I was. <laughs> I should add script variables to this as well. And that's not how you do it. Script, script, script. Did I not add script to this? Oh, I thought about adding script to this and then promptly did not. This is not how you do it. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, game objects are what um, Unity uses, right? That's what they're called? Yeah. And I think the, the same techniques from Unity, I, I want to say also apply to Godot as well. I'm pretty sure in that you want to have a very, very flat uh, node hierarchy. So like this, right? Like this is very flat. The more nested your node hierarchy becomes, the, I guess the more time it takes to process as well. In general, at least. I want to say that's how it works in Godot. Um, I think it, at, le at the very least, it's easier to work with, <laughs> with a flatter hierarchy. I should really test it one of these days. All right, I'll we'll get rid of this, exit the editor. A hello, coding buddy. A oh, hello, hello. I'm not your buddy, friend.
I also don't think I'm your friend guy. <laughs> I suspect Godot's workflow is very Unity inspired, so a lot carries over. I'm, not, I'm actually not sure if Godot is Unity inspired. So when was Unity release date? Oh, 2005. And then when was Godot 1.0 release date? Oh, OK. You know what? I retract my statement. <laughs> Although it was their own hobbyist engine, but okay, 2005 is I'm pretty sure way earlier than Godot. I want to say like the earliest Godot was even being used as like an in-house engine was like 2009-ish. Yeah, I mean the Unity workflow is a good one for sure. Having the, you know, just a, a list, a tree of potential objects that need to be acted upon by the scene is always nice. Go dot? Absolutely not. <laughs> Calling a go dot is wrong. But I, I can understand why you would call it that. It's a French term. <laughs> Just like when you, you say the word rendezvous, you don't say rendezvous. <laughs> even though that's how it should be pronounced in English. It's a rendezvous. You don't pronounce the Z, the Z is silent. <laughs> right, rendezvous is spelled with a rendezvous. Yeah, or, sorry, I got the Z in the wrong position. Rendezvous, rendezvous. We'll have a nice rend rendezvous. In the same way, it's Godot, not Godot. It is, everything is a game object thing was very influential in general, for better or worse. Yeah. I mean, how else would you do it, I guess? <laughs> I, like, at some point, you need to have some sort of abstraction for, you know, this is an object that needs to have, uh, like, game engine ticks applied to it, right? You know, the, at some point, the code is going to look ugly. That's basically it. If item is light or item is camera. We'll do all of this. And then we'll do create elements, vbox, item, and then globals, ignored spatial properties. Yeah, something like that. French people, I speak French. Yeah. They really do, though. French is one of those languages I just don't know how to speak, though, unfortunately. French is hard. Because it does the English thing and has contractions and silent words. <laughs> or silent, not silent words, but silent, uh, silent letters, which is tough. You should just do it phonetically, like Spanish, where you almost always pronounce every single letter in the word. And she's for data systems for logic. It's probably the other major school of thought at this point. You mean ECS? Or actually, that's an EC, but an ECS is where it is making a comeback for sure. Like, I, I, Unity is actually an EC. Godot is closer to just raw, object-oriented programming. French is one of the languages ever. Yeah, you know what? It is definitely one of the languages. For sure. Not necessarily ECS, that's where e well, that's where ECS comes from. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. An EC, right? Entity components. So entities are just integers. Components are logic and data. Where an ECS is entities are just integers. Uh, that contain components, or that have components associated with them. Uh, components are just data, systems are logic. And anything is, else is kind of a abstraction over that. I guess like MVC or MVCC, whatever, is a, it's its own kind of architecture as well. Just data oriented in general, yeah. yeah. Is one of the, Godot is actually not one of the programming languages ever, that's not true. I think this is probably fine. 
I don't know. I mean, this should be exposed in the, the UI right now anyways. Nope. Aren't I exposing this in the UI? So, uh, default GUI. Oh, you know, I just added it to here. <laughs> and then, oh yeah, I need to add it here as well. Then we can do it. Data oriented, object oriented programming markup language. Yep, that's um, definitely word salad. I think you could definitely impress your project manager, possibly a partner, maybe a salesperson, a solutions architect as they're called. Stage. Uh, that's not entirely correct, but I also didn't get any errors. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've worked with Bevy before, but it, I think the problem with Bevy is that I, it kind of goes to, where Bevy is the preeminent Rust game engine, has the most advanced render in theory, uh, has the most ergonomic ECS in my opinion. And um, I'm thinking of the other things. What, what's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it follows the ECS pattern, but something I don't understand about it is how, how are you supposed to switch scenes? <laughs> like if you have like multiple screens, I don't, I, I don't understand how to switch between screens in Bevy. That's like the one thing I need answered, but I just do not care enough to actually find out the answer. Stage keys, current screen gets stage, default runner gets stage. Is get stage not actually returning anything? All right, so it is returning something, so I'm, now there's a bug. Uh, so it is two. We can guarantee a certain subset of features, so I can guarantee that get stage is actually returning something. So that's fine. But this is kind of a blind call. Oh, hello, Bumzy, hello, hello. Oh, look at this. Look at this, hello, Bumzy, hello, hello. We can, we can run it again. We now have a fancy splash screen, courtesy of someone in my Discord who didn't really like the the lull splash screen I had going on. This is props. This is not it. That's cute. Not, no, you. Yeah, there's an alpha out. So I, I made a lot of progress over my PTO last week. Look at that. Beautiful. And it's also finally got around to packing the face tracker inside of a, a Pi installer binary. So now we're redistributing things in a, uh, a sensible cross-platform way. So stage, yeah, okay, stage, this is right. Am I not passing in, am I not adding this stuff to it? Create elements. Eh. Uh, Add child. Yep, that's right. So this is working. And we have an item. Item is whatever the object that is. Yep. Create a scroll container. Oh, I see. <laughs> I forgot to I forgot to add this as a child. Add. I suppose I should be adding. I should add add child. Let's see. Cool, so it's stable. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> it is, um, all the features are kind of there uh, in a somewhat finished state. That's pretty much it. So it's, it's ready for testing, kind of. There's no crashes as far as I know. No one's reported a crash so far. I know on Linux, there is a problem where the tracker stays on for too long. So. Generally what happens is if you go back to the main menu via this or you press X on the window decorator, uh, it should kill all the trackers automatically. But I guess on Linux, freaking Linux dude, um, sending sig kill to the, the face tracker doesn't actually kill the process, even though sig kill should like immediately kill it. Or at least I think that's what Godot sends. It might be just sending like sig terminate and then Pi, the, the face tracker just says, you know what? I don't really feel like terminating. That's possible. All right, there we go. Look at that. It's just that easy. I did a lot of talking. Didn't really seem like I was doing too much. Uh, but look at that. 
it's, it's not so bad. You know, one of those things I feel like I get a lot of, of flack for is, you know, this dude doesn't really seem to be doing anything. But no, look at that. <laughs> now we generate everything as is needed. Uh, now I just need to have better names. And also, like, name the, the element properly, or name the page correctly. Maybe it tries to kill it after it's dead, so OS holds the process. It's possible, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's not, though. So whenever the default runner, I mean, I, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but this is the idea. Right, is that we do, we run through every single tracker that you have listed as a tracker, and then we call stop receiver on it. You know what? That might be it. Hold on. <laughs> now that I'm saying it out loud, hold on. Is that implemented on Linux? It should be the same thing. It's possible that it's just kind of hanging on Linux. It's, oh, you know what? It might be hanging on Linux. Well, no, that's stop tracker. Stop tracker is stopping face tracker. Oh, you know what? It's probably this. Since sig kill might be slow. I, I think sig kill should be pro pretty, probably pretty fast, but it, it might be this. I'm not sure. You know what? I, I'm. It, it's possibly this. Actually, Demuriel, if you're still here, <laughs> if you're still here, can you try this? Is just um, copy this. So instead of having ex executing p kill in the terminal, you could just execute this instead. Maybe I think that might work better. That that, that might be why I forgot. So when you are spawning, yeah, it's it's um. Thank you, Bumpy. That was actually very helpful. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like exactly it, but it was pretty close. So the OS is holding the process. No, yes. Yes, OS is holding the process, but for whatever reason, pkill is not working. But I'm pretty sure if we just allow Godot to send sig kill, so use this here. So instead of doing this, you do this. So let me grab all this stuff. So basically, turn it into that. Right, I, I think that will work. That might fix that bug. <laughs> that might fix that bug. You can just put one second's delay to test it or a way for kill to be complete. See, that's kind of hard, right? It's because I have the kill command in the kind of teardown function. And then teardown is only on, uh, what do you call it? What is it? Exit tree. So you cannot wait in exit tree, unfortunately. I suppose we could just block the entire fun the entire application, but no. I, I think th I think this is actually the problem is that we're trying to kill it incorrectly. That's basically it. So previously we were using pkill and running a shell command uh, because in the previous version of this OpenCPHDD on Linux, uh, we spawned a bash process to handle the tracker, but now on the current version. We're just letting Gizzo handle the, we, we maintain the parent-child process relationship. You can stop before exit tree. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, which I want to avoid doing that if possible, right? Otherwise the application will hang and then that'll be reported as a bug. That's, that's, you know, I already have enough things being reported as bugs that aren't actually bugs. Control name is equal to prop name capitalize. What am I doing? Uh, and then this is also where the, this is the hard part as well. 
is how the heck do I, yeah, see, this is also how I know. <laughs> I was not in a good headspace yesterday. <laughs> I wrote like 200 lines of code, but actually all you need is just this. It's so much simpler. Well, you just need this and then I need to hook everything up. Hmm. So we have the prop name. The control name needs to be capitalized like so. Uh, also, something that you might be interested in, Bumzi, since I know that you do other stuff. Check this out. I wrote a thing called flag GD. It's just a flag parser for Gido. Not the most glamorous thing, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to define it's it's I, I was originally writing something like Python's arg parse. Python's arg parse is actually one of my favorite implementations of an argument parser. Like I know there's clap or whatever for Rust, but just I, <laughs> I feel like once you start getting into like a lot of functionality, it's just kind of a pain. Whereas arg parse has always worked for me. It's also very slow, but whatever. But we have, where's my app manager? So we define all of this stuff. So we have like all logs you can pass as a flag. You can pass environments as a flag. So I no longer actually need to um, define environment variables. As an environment variables, I can just pass it as an argument. Something like that. What is flag though? Oh, it's kill. We're just fine. Yeah, okay. There we go. Uh... Uh, do you see how hard this is? <laughs> There's so much like um, legacy stuff from before when like this application was just held together by duct tape, and now it needs to, uh, the the duct tape is starting to to tear. If you catch my drift, <laughs> so we need to go back, replace all the duct tape with a good solution, and it's, it's just absolutely killing me. But yeah, so we can go to export windows. So if we run vpupper, and then I can pass stay on splash as a flag, like that. Look at that. We can do this. So now, and then like all these flags are par parsed immediately. So there is a little bit of slowdown. That's fine, in my opinion. That's what the load. That's what the splash screen is for. So, the splash screen would be an amazing runner selector. I'm not sure how you would even select runners from this. I mean, I guess I could put this in the background. I don't. I don't really know how this would factor into this, a runner selector. The back. The background is definitely very nice. I could definitely see. I could make this transparent. I think. I go to runner. That, that, that is a good point. <laughs> I didn't really think about it. It would be nice in the background for sure. No, that's default runner. Where's my runner? Runners. OK, hold on. Oh, this is the landing screen. Right, right, right. So background. I could just make this transparent. I mean, the flag and bash are CLI. Yes, both. Well, it's a, it's a flag. It's a param, basically. So you can pass args to whatever you're running. Middle end. I'm not reading all that. <laughs> Buzzword salad. I mean, adding big runner buttons instead of that UI. Hmm. 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 I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking. How would you how would you lay that out? So I'm, I'm I'm not disagreeing with you. Like I'm not super attached to this, but this is the best I had at the time. Mostly because like I I think I asked at some point, and then I got no feedback. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just do my own thing. 
So this is actually the same UI that I'm using here. Oh, hold on. This is the same UI that I use for my, like all my stream tools, right? <laughs> or it's roughly the same uh, with the addition of little tabs on the top. Oh, I almost closed this, by the way. Don't close this. Otherwise, it'll kill my face tracker and everything else, really. I'm a fan of V Pupper. I like the V Pupper splash screen, I would use it as a wallpaper. It is like a really, really nice looking splash screen, isn't it? It's, it's really, really nice looking. I'm, I'm actually surprised. I mean, so if the splash screen logo, duck to the sign, add the list of runners in the list in the background. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious. Shift the splash screen logo and the duck a bit to the side and add a list of runners in the list, but not the button, just buttons. No but no background, just buttons. So keep the keep the list of things here. So maybe hold on. <laughs> there's there's not really a great way of disabling the parallax effect just yet. Um Hold on. If I, I need to. Oh, I see. Because <laughs> it, when you press any, literally any button, it will exit, <laughs> or it will leave the splash. But basically, move this up, move this more to the side, and then just have like a big box here, something like that. Let me let me take a let me take a screenshot. Let me take a screenshot. Where's my snipping tool? Window snip. Yes. So just button in an invisible box. So like move, move this up. Move this probably more into the corner. And then we'll have like a just a list of buttons here. So this is where all the runners would be. So you're a runner, runner, runner. And then you could have other UI options. So maybe you would have like the little, oh, the duck is fine there. Yeah, yeah, I think the duck is fine there, yeah. But, and then maybe you would have like an option. And then all the options would be in a little option menu up there or maybe down here. Ooh, you know what? You know what? I actually really, really like that. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. That's that's actually a oh that's that's a phenomenal idea. Man, I like that. <laughs> I like that. Let me save this. And I'll post it to the Discord <laughs> so I can keep hold of it. Main menu type of thing, yeah. All right, let me post it here. Uh, why are all my windows kind of messed up? Why is why is this so small now? V buffer. No, it's not on V buffer. It's under documents. Look at my documents. Uh, Capture. Um, restructure main V main menu like this. Yes. Oh. And then I guess snip. Give this a save. Pose to is currently there. My flag GD is cool, so you can make commands manage easier. Yeah, it basically does all the parsing for you. That's that's the idea. That's the idea. And then I'm, I'm planning on extending it so it's closer to arc parse. 
So uh, have you used Python arg parse? So you can have like, uh, so you can count the amount of times a flag appears or whatever. So like Python has like verbosity levels that you can actually set by doing like dash VVV or dash V for like low verbosity, dash VV for extra verbose, etc. Only a few CLI tools from Gadot editor, yeah. I mean, it's a very simple project, right? And then you can even see the example. Well, vpupper is the example, I guess, where I'm using it here. Look at that. How nice. The only problem is that Godot has a few, has a, actually a, a pretty good amount of, what do you call it, uh, reserved flags. So like slash s slash v. Like, I can still parse that, but Godot will also intercept those, which is very annoying, which is why all of these are... I don't, I don't have any single letter flags, essentially. Like, all logs is essentially verbose, but verbose is already reserved by Godot. But, I don't know. I, I, I think it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Not so bad. I only wish that there was a better way of doing this stuff instead of just using a dictionary, but what can you do? Make a, make a window that tracks outside processes, like HTOP. What would that be used for? Like I was thinking on a run at some, and when I was running, I was like, what if I just made like a, like a better postman using Godot? <laughs> Or maybe not a better Postman, but, you know, a Postman-like application. Because I think Postman is an open source, right? Yeah, Postman is an open source. But Postman is very good. Only connected processes in their status, like a tracker. That's kind of hard, because it's very OS-specific. I have done that for my Stream Stuff Runner thing. Stream Stuff Runner. Well, I've only implemented it for Windows. So we have a, a Windows handler, which, you know, so we do like find process and look at how much garbage you have to sift through for finding Windows stuff, which is why I'm trying to avoid doing as much. I don't want to do any cross-platform specific stuff or platform specific stuff. I want to do cross-platform stuff. So like if you want to find a process, guess what? <laughs> this is what you have to do. If you want to... Check out if PID exists. Well, I mean, after that, once once you find the processes, it's not so hard. But parsing processes is a little tough. Okay, let's see. Hmm. So control name, and then we need to. If control, hold on. Hmm. I guess we can do if control is color picker. Oh, actually, hold on. The color pickers don't have a name associated with them either, right? I think I just realized that. Do I also have multiple of the same process up? Oh, no, I don't. Like if it hangs out the CPU usage in the bottom bar or something? Hmm, maybe. I don't really need something like that though. <laughs> well, it's not very useful for me personally, but I don't know. Cause that, that's, what, that's what your terminal is for, right? Is you can just check all that stuff without needing to, you know, use a very expensive GUI thing. All right. All right. I got to think about this. Actually, what does this look like right now? So skip. 
I need to have the option to skip past. So set like a runner as a, you know, load directly into the runner if you want. Stage. Hmm. <laughs> I think this also needs to be an H box, unfortunately. Till. Do the same thing, so label. Yeah, I think I'm going to wait on the consensus for the restructuring of the runner thing. Oh, someone's ping me. Yeah. I'll wait on it, but I think most of you are going to be in favor of the, <laughs> the nicer looking thing, I guess. I think that that does call into question what the heck am I doing with the splash then? Because I, if we're loading straight into the the runner, that kind of brings us back to the previous problem of like now we need to have a thing before the splash. <laughs> think about it, because the splash is meant to give Godot time to read all the extension files. But now we're no longer doing that. And now, and now we're in a weird place. Hmm. Hbox add child. Color picker. Hbox. Okay, so this is also going to be Hbox. Stuff. We do need to assign text to the label just so we know what the heck we are changing. So this is prop name. I'm pretty sure there's no way to add text to a color picker button. Or actually, hold on. No, what am I doing? I don't need any of this. This just needs to be a color picker, color picker button, right? So say goodbye. What a fool I am. Color picker button. That's going to throw an error, but we'll just ignore it for now. So this is color picker buton. Color picker button, just so we're consistent. Oh. And I guess the from the color picker button, we need to. Same screen, but loading bar in the place where the runners would be below the logo. That kind of looked like it was loading the runners. Well, it's not actually loading just the runners. It's loading like literally everything else. That's kind of the. That's kind of where I'm at with that. Is that we're we're loading a lot of stuff in the background. So everything that is present in the app manager is being set up. So we have the pub sub, we have the log manager, we have the config manager, we have the extension manager, notification manager is not yet implemented. The extension manager is the slow part for sure. Uh, so I, I need to give it time to load. Otherwise, you know, we'll run into, you know, a null pointer exception at some point where it expected a resource, but there was no resource there even though there is a resource there. Like that's what we're, that's the worst kind of error is like, the resource is clearly there, but it's saying it's not there. Why is that? And it's, oh, it's because it's a race condition. Oh, great. That's what the splash screen is supposed to do. So maybe I just get a new splash screen. <laughs> I could always just get a different splash screen and then just keep that one static or something. That might be better. I don't know. It's still up in the air. We can figure it out. Color picker button. And then this has a, what's color? Hmm. 
the currently selected color. I guess that's fine. So we do it like this, using a color picker button. Then that allows me to assign text to the button, I think. Yeah, equals prop name. All right, when the show real voting happens. I'm not sure. I think the show real voting has already started. So if you go to my YouTube channel, I'm not sure if my YouTube channel is actually displayed on Twitch. Let me check. If I look at my stream manager and I get out of my stream manager, how do I go? How, how do I get to my stream? <laughs> Not in the. Do I list my YouTube? Oh no. No, my YouTube is not on my my thing. That's fine. That's fine. I, it doesn't matter. There's nothing on my YouTube anyways, besides like vods. Let me see. Yeah, there's the show reel. I'm not, I don't know if there's like the show reel voting has already started. I I do would like to, I would like to note that it does have a lot of views on it, so that must be true. I'm assuming most of these other views are just bots. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure it's started. Where's the Godot show reel stuff, anyways? Godot show reel. Sure. Where is the news though? Uh, I'm, I, I don't know. It's, I, it's not me. <laughs> I don't. I don't handle it. We can log in though. No show reels are open to votes or submissions. I guess it's it's done. Maybe. I don't know. Like maybe the show reel voting only took place for a month, and then they're just like collating all of them. I have no idea. Uh, University of Melbourne <laughs> paid research study sent me a message somehow. I don't even live in Australia. All right, so uh, stage, not the most there's no text associated with it. It's just the color. Yeah. All right, so that might be a bit tough. <laughs> that might be a bit tough. Hmm. I think that, that the, the way that it automatically sets itself, though, is really nice. So I don't need to, to worry about it at all. Although the fact that it does always kind of just place itself at the very top. Well. No, it places it the bottom flush with the, the button. Okay, well, that's not my problem. Look at those close like they didn't post it. That's on them, or it didn't happen yet. I don't know. I, <laughs> you're asking the wrong guy. I do not know. Fonts of the color picker buttons text. There is no text. Eh. Color picker buttons don't have text, right? Maybe they do and I'm stupid. Let me open up my scratch project again. So we add a, nope. What is it, control A? Yeah. Color picker buton. Make it pretty big. Can you add text? Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> like you're able to, where does the text even show up? Why are you allowed to add text to the color picker button? Or is it something that, is it something that only shows up when you hover? What? Is it there? Like it, it says it does have text. Edit alpha, I don't know what that means. Yeah. And it, it, there's no way to jump into the button either. So, hmm, don't save. Okay, well, that's unpleasant. 
So I think we still need to do the H box thing. I'll grab this. Mm hmm. A child color picker button. So at the very least, this will structure itself a bit better. Maybe text and color both black. Well, it's because like the even if the color was white, it doesn't show up either. That's props stage. So at least this is consistent. I, 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 yeah, this is probably better anyways, whatever, right? Because now the, the color shows up predictably, or now you just have like a big list of, here's all the things, you know, on the left, and then the actual values to control it are on the right. So I think that makes more sense anyways, whatever. The, the problem that this poses, though, is that now I need to do like a blind get child if I want to connect the actual elements to them. Something like that. So, hmm. And uh, prop name. We'll call it display name. Some sort of string is equal to prop name capitalize capitalize definitely a word I'm very bad at spelling display name yeah okay so this is what we're looking for right now so stage keep aspect blah blah I don't really know what this is supposed to or actually do Okay, I didn't assign anything to the buttons. Uh, so check button text is equal to prop name. Short for property name. You added to the VBox? What do you mean the VBox? Isn't, aren't, aren't they all added to the VBox already? Or um, uh, I guess I'm misunderstanding something. Yeah, look at that. Like whole mask probably shouldn't be here <laughs> since that's actually a, uh, that's um, what's it called? Just a, a bit, uh, what's it called? Bit, bit, bit field, yeah. Missed the early bits of the stream, what are the functionalities of the stage options? So the stage options are, uh, so there's no names associated with these yet, but I'll, I'll be adding those. Uh, so this is like the camera options. I remember, I think there is actually still a GitHub issue open for adjusting the FOV. Isn't a killer, color picker pop-up? It is a color picker pop-up, yep. And there is no V box. Well, it's an H box inside of a V box, right? But yeah, look at this. <laughs> I mostly did a lot of talking, but here we are. And look, this is actually the background color that's being used right now. This is the background color. So now all I need to do is hook this up and so that these changes will take effect immediately when you change it. I can finally close my... Oh, was that you? <laughs> was that you? Was that your issue? Time to get exposed. <laughs> Are you J.A. Cop? So you press a color picker, add it to the VBox after the element, or that will look bad? What do you mean? Oh, are you saying, um, instead of having this pop up like this, you're saying to have this be like its own small VBox, and so this will pop down instead, instead of having its own kind of separate pop up? Is that what you're saying? Mmm, you know what, that, that is an idea. That is an idea. So instead, hmm. Is it possible for me to prevent it from popping up? And then I can, 
I can kind of intercept that and, and instead like push it inside of the V box. So instead of I'm trying to think of how you I, I know what you're saying and that's I think it, it, it might look nicer for sure. Call the color picker on press. Well, this is like a built-in functionality. Right. No, I definitely opened an issue about it. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Jacob. Get exposed. Yeah, it's combined, yeah. So I'm not really sure how to prevent it. Well, I know how you would prevent it, but I'm not sure if it's even worth it. Right? Yeah, it says this is a required internal node. Removing and freeing. If you wanna hide it, but you, you can't force it to be hidden, right? Otherwise, like, you'll get like a single frame. Well, you'll, you'll see the pop-up kind of flash on screen and then get placed into the V-Box, if that makes sense. So I, I don't want to do that. All right, I want to avoid doing that. Hmm. But I, th I think the, I'm thinking of a way to do that. Cause I, I know what you're saying, Bumzy, and I know it would be a lot nicer if it, this popped up here instead of like as a, you know, in your face kind of thing like this. But I'm not sure how to intercept that while still maintaining like the little preview rectangle. Like the little preview rectangle is really nice. I wonder if you can do it via a texture button. You know what? Let's let's try that. I think I think that could work via like a texture button maybe. So if if I had it not worth it, it might be worth it. Let me see. <laughs> so texture. Wait, hold on. Can you do can you do like a regular button? Can you do like a regular button? We'll make it somewhat big, why not? And then if you add a color rect inside of it, no, that's not how that works, okay, well. <laughs> cause you need, it has to color back cause it's just, yeah, yeah, well I'm, I'm saying like, I don't know. <laughs> like you could intercept the color as well. Like you, you can intercept all bits and pieces of it. The only thing I would need to do is disable the pop-up, but I'm not sure if that's even possible without some flashing. Like it, something that would be nice would be to do something like this, where I construct my own button that shows the display color. That would be nice. Um, clearly this is not how you do it, but just rect fill and column rect fill. Eh? What do you mean? A, bu a button is not a container node, unfortunately. Or wait, hold on. Brain, brain, brain is, gears are turning. Hold on, I got it. Hold on. You can do margin container. You can do a margin container and then like stick a button in there and then also stick a color rect in there and then add a margin to the color rect. Well, I guess we don't add a margin, but we set the anchors to be fully anchored. Wait, is that how that works? I don't think that's how it works. <laughs> no, the margin container is setting the... Oh, this needs to be a panel container then. Uh. So you set this to be a panel container. Oh. Color it does have mouse click signal, does it? Well, it's not. It doesn't. It's not a button, though, right? That's the. That's the problem. That's the problem. Is that it doesn't have a button. Right, and then we can do a style box empty. Right, assign like that, and then set content margins of like I don't know five 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 five. No, but then the button, the button. Uh, the button respects the 
Yeah, you know what? This is actually going to be more difficult than I thought it would be. <laughs> Isn't there... Because I, I need to have the button so I get the nice kind of UI effect and I get all the UI handling done for me as, or the, the input handling done for me as well. Right, like that's, that's, that's the idea. That's the idea is I, <laughs> I offload as much stuff to Godot as possible at this point because I've realized, realized the folly of my ways. Right, Godot provides the default theming. I want to have the default theming. That's 100%. Right, so all you notice that like the the theme for everything is pretty consistent because it's using default, the, the Godot's theme, the editor theme, not the default theme. Button effects in the color rect color picker, because it, it looks nice. <laughs> it looks nice. I don't think you need. Yeah, well, I don't need any effects, right? But it looks nice, and I think when your UI looks nice, you kind of have a higher opinion. <laughs> you kind of have a higher opinion of whatever you're using. And it would just look bad, right? I, I, uh, uh. If I'm already consistent here, I might as well try to be consistent everywhere, right? No, Are there only for color boxes? No, absolutely not. If it's just the one edge case, then we need to handle the one edge case. No, if it was like 50-50, then whatever, right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> but if, if we have the one edge case, we need to handle the one edge case. If half my elements were edge cases, then we, then nothing is an edge case. Therefore, you don't handle it. Yeah, I don't think this is feasible. You know, we'll, we'll leave that for later. I, I already have the functionality more or less. That's fine. Hmm. Never saw any button effects on any color picker. Well, Godot's. Godot's thing has a button effect, which is what I'm saying, is that this has a button effect. This is the button effect, right? Is that you, it persists after you click it. And the theming is the same as well, which is the points. It integrates really nicely with Godot's default theme, which is nice. That's what we want. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we, we, can, we can always go back to that. Here, I need to figure out how to connect these. So unfortunately, handle property only gives me back one object. It would be nice if this returned a tuple. This is something else I was thinking about implementing just on my own. So in addition to like results and error, like all my, my fancy error handling with these classes, look at that. So we have results. Oh, that yeah. Look at that. It is beautiful. Class result. Intermediate class for safely handling errors. You will not find that pretty much anywhere because that's that's my own custom code. So in addition to that, I could just have I could just implement my own tuple objects because it would be nice if this returned a tuple to me. So I could uh, you know you have the control. And then you also have the type that it figured out. But that's fine. We can do without for now. Unfortunately, now we have to do if uh, type or no. If control is <laughs> a check button, then we need to connect the check button. Control. That's pretty easy. Else, we need to rip out the specific thing, right? I suppose I also could just wrap. <laughs> I could wrap it afterwards. So this always returns to me a text edit, a check button, or a color picker button. And then I wrap it afterwards, depending on the type. But it's, it's fine. This is fine. Whatever. If control get child one that's super this is super fragile I, I need to think of a better way but I know this will work is a <laughs> a text edit then connect text edit Uh, 
initial get child one. So elements. Else connect a color picker, something like that. Yeah, or that's actually the color picker button, not a color picker. Color picker button. Need to be exact, otherwise, I'm going to get this wrong later. You need to hedge your bets when you're. <laughs> You are your own worst enemy. Set myself up to fail. Thank you very much for redeeming a hydrate. Oh, thank you very much, anonymous viewer, for the follow. Yeah. That's really cool, actually, how the model was able to track my eyes while I had my water bottle all the way in the front of my face. How often do you wash your water bottles, by the way? Because uh, I can tell you right now that I do not wash my water bottle enough. <laughs> it's kind of gross, but I was like, I was taking a sip out of it. Kind of noticed at some point, I was like, wait, is that kind of like a residue at the very top of the inside of it? Kind of stuck my finger inside. I said, oh, that is extremely gross. Like, I'll, Thin, thick-ish, but is you know still a thin layer of slime on the inside. Oh, you know what? It has been like half a year since I've cleaned this. <laughs> oh, hello, knock. Hello, hello. I see you have returned to grace us with your presence. Your monthly check-in. Hello, hello. Gross water bottles. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Check this out. Look at that. Ooh, what a nice effect. And we'll go on to the uh, actual UI. The UI, I'm thinking I'm going to redesign it. But now tracking works, blah, blah, blah. You're able to load in random presets as well. Uh, so we're almost back up to where we're, we were before. Oh, well, that's not good. <laughs> what happened? Oh, it's because it's... Oh, it, it, this should be connect line edits, right? Are these text edits? Have I been making these text edits? Oh, these should be line edits. That's my bad. I, I, I fooled myself. Ooh, fancy. Good progress. Thank you, thank you. Also, check this out. We have. Custom flag parsing, so we can do this. I did not make this graphic, by the way. This is contributed by community manager member. So you button is clickable, whatever. You can pass a flag if you want to stay on the screen for too long or for longer than usual. Click past, blah, blah. Extensions are all dynamically loaded, so you can always look at them in the file system. You have settings. I still need to get around to that, <laughs> filling it out. Uh, but then you can run it. You can also select your GUI if you want, but you know, of course, there's only one GUI. So it doesn't really matter at this point. And then tracking works. So if I turn off the tracker here, boom, just so they don't conflict. And so we have some more options, or it's really just the one option. <laughs> so Open Sea Face has uh, five tracking options plus three, which don't really s fit on the regular scale for some reason. Uh, but running it on potato mode is fine. Break your neck as usual. And look at that. Look at that. On potato mode, though, the a lot of the tracking uh, niceties are <laughs> much, much lower. Uh, but here we are. But yeah. How how are you? Diary asked you how you were. How are you? Hmm. Although there's no stage here. What happened to my stage? Hold on. 
What happened to my stage? The new UI bit is gone, and I don't know why. It's freaking me out. Or did I accidentally run the... Oh, and you know what? I ran the, <laughs> the release build. That's why. By the way, Potato, what's the CPU consumption? All right, thanks for asking me that right after I closed it. Much appreciated. <laughs> um, let me see. So I, I think measuring my CPU consumption isn't great because I have a, an extremely beefy computer. But we can check. This is running in release mode, so this is probably a better check of a better comparison, shall we say. Uh, it's probably this one. No, it's probably this one. No, it's probably this one. Oh my god, yeah, look at that. This is using, well, it's using a pretty good amount of CPU, which is fair. But the memory consumption is really, really low. Doing good, moved away from game dev for a bit, decided to go back to web dev. Uh, <laughs> I see uh, we're a masochist among us. From from one horrible task to the other. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why the CPU consumption is so much lower, by the way, for this build as opposed to this build. That doesn't make any sense to me, actually. Why is, why is OpenSea Face GD using one gig of memory, whereas Virtual Puppet Project is only using 200 megs? I guess I'm pretty sure it's not the model. Also, I, <laughs> that, that is somewhat accurate to how my eyes are moving, but that's it's a bit too far. <laughs> I can see in my peripheral version is like floating off her face. But I, I, th those are all options that can be tweaked. You did a giga cleanup of the code. That's true. I did do a giga cleanup of the code. That's. <laughs> I don't know though. Something seems really weird about that, but I, I guess I won't question it too much. But we can I guess we can call that another win. We can we can do a little screenshot magic so I can show that off. What's it called? Snipping tool? Ignore the Genshin impact there. Genshin impact, honestly, one of my still one of my most played games. Because of just an actual degenerate. Because, you know, in my opinion, it's still, like, a really good game. Is it super predatory? Yes. But also, like, the game itself is still pretty good. Fun combat. All right, we can, we can use this as a... Some propaganda. <laughs> Move on to the new one. It's probably easier on resources, maybe. I don't know. Based off one sample size of one, it's, it uses less memory. Wind shift as the screenshot? Absolutely not. I like snipping tool. <laughs> I, 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 if I really wanted to, if you really want to get like pedantic, I really should just be pre pressing print screen. But where is print screen on this keyboard? I only have scroll lock. And then there's also a a pause and break button, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure no OS actually listens to anymore. Oh no, Singapore. That's not a real place. Uh, how do you import? How, how do I open files? Where did I even save those? Oh, that was under documents. So. Open that. Give this a copy. Oh, oh! I need to open another paint thing, actually, don't I? Open paint again. Paste this there. Go here. I don't know why I'm not doing this in paint.net. And then just slap that there. And then do this. Wee. My favorite tool. Like, honestly, like, paint gets a lot of hate, but the ability to, like, resize images just on the fly like that is really nice. 
All right, so what is this? We'll call this mem usage comparison. Look at that. Um, where is my Discord? Discord. Discord. <laughs> By the way, I have a Discord if you want to check that out. Uh, it also tried to invite me to my own Discord. I suppose I shouldn't click on that then. All right. Since I'm already there. Are you going to release an alpha bin update with the new changes from today? Uh, not really. I mean, I guess I could. I guess I could. All right, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna post this in here, I guess. What did I call this? Mem usage comparison. What's eyes? Is it eyes? Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> but no, I. I mean, I guess I could add that. Is there's not too many changes though, right? I think I would want to get another menu out of the way before I release another alpha build. Because otherwise there's not too much to put in the change log. And also generating release builds is a huge pain. So I'm, I'm trying to, you know, do it only when it really counts because my, my scripts are not up to scuff just yet. <sighs> So much to do, not enough time. All right, so this should be connect line edit. All right, so how are we connecting these? So we have the the prop name actually. Yeah, so we have the prop name, so we can just connect it blind like that. Prop name. Something like that. We'll go to <laughs> base tree layout. No, this is in base layout. What is this? That's fine. So we won't be using any of this stuff, or maybe we will. Text changed if AM CM has data. Text. You know what? I think I could. I can reuse connect line edit. I can reuse check button. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh, this is actually beautiful. Just connect element this, control. Look at this, previous me, big brain. Current me, total idiot. I just need to change which element I'm passing in. Wait, even bigger brain. Uh, connect elements, we'll do the Python thing. So control if control is check button, else. Hey, 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 control get child one. And then we'll just pass in the prop name. Oh, that is so nice. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, thank you very much, uh, anonymous viewer, for the follow. Much appreciated. My break is over. Catch you later, maybe in a month. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your uh, monthly check in knock. Much appreciated. Take it easy. Good to know that you're still alive. Which is actually, that came out a lot more menacing than I intended it to. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much it though, right? You pop in every once in a while and say, oh, okay, they're still around, you know. Haven't fallen off the face of the earth just yet. Not until you get onto the Daddy Elon's Mars rocket, at least. Yeah, but look at that. I'm pretty sure if I ever connect this, though, this is going to explode. Uh, not like literally explode, but uh, these these options are not unique right now. So hold on, <laughs> let's not connect them just yet because they're not unique options. I need a way to determine 
which elements we are applying, if that makes sense. Maybe I can have an enum here. We'll, we'll just make a, a little cheeky little enum. So stage item. So we'll call this ba ba ba. That's there's light, lights, camera, world. <laughs> Not quite the, the catchphrase, but it's close. There's your none. I'm still in caps lock, which is what I feared. OK. So handle property. So there's the VBox. There is your object and your ignore list. Or let's call it type. So type is some sort of integer. It needs to be passed in, which makes this wrong. So now I need to differentiate if I need to differentiate between lights and cameras. Okay, so this will be stage item dot light. I'll also call this ba ba ba. No, oh, that's fine. So that's light. This is going to be L if item is camera. Call this camera. And then this one is stage item. How do you spell world again? I don't know why I kept trying to spell world with an E. All right, there we go. So now we have our stage item type here, type. So then I think I need to, like the config name, like there's the display name and then the config name. So those are two different things. So var config name is some sort of string. We'll think about it. Or maybe we'll just set it later, I suppose. So ba ba ba. So match type. So stage item light. Config name is equal to hmm it's Stage lights this. <laughs> and then we'll grab the, the prop name like that. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So then I can, I'll go back to my model config. I'll get rid of these things, or I'll get rid of main light and main world environments. And then I'll just do what I did for uh, like all these interpolation options, just add a separate field for them. Because, uh, you know, what, what else are we going to do, right? Or actually, we can do prop name. Config name is equal to prop name, which is going to be some sort of string. This, this is not really a huge benefit to doing it like this, but, you know. So this will be config name. So we. We will at least always have a config name associated with it, like that. That's the benefit of doing it like that. Instead of as, as initially assigning it to, uh, you know what? I think assigning it to an empty string is better. <laughs> right? Because if there's an error, well, because you should never run into an error. I, I guess it doesn't make a difference, but I, I think it's better to if we have an error, it should be obvious. So if it's empty, it's obvious. Yeah, OK. I like that reasoning. <laughs> Let's stop thinking about it now before I overthink it. So this will be stage ba, 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 camera underscore string formats prop name. And then stage item. What was it? World. State. World. 
ba ba Prop name. Okay. Not so bad. And I, of course, will always have the default error. So, unhandled config item type or stage item type stage item okay there we go so then we have our config name here we will re-enable this and but we won't be using the prop name we'll be using the config name and then oh no <laughs> um okay now all we need to do is for every single config item listed here, we need to add a corresponding entry here. Oh, good. Some of these I don't need to have, by the way, so I, I should go in and, you know, uh, just add like a list of like, ignored values so editor only doesn't do anything there's no reason for that directional shadow mode you know <laughs> maybe probably not coal mask absolutely not but layers i'm also not sure what that means include inbound not sure portal mode not sure uh but like light color, light energy, indirect size, light size, I don't really know what that means. Uh, light negative, I think does the inverse, maybe? Bake mode should not be here as well. Yeah, maybe, there's a lot of things that should not be included, actually. Mm. Oh, but for this, the world environment, there's a ton of things that you can enable, for sure. Ooh. See, this, this is all stuff that needs to be done. There's not a great way to do it programmatically. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be fun. It's really just a lot of boring manual labor, essentially, which is kind of the programming style that I am really good at, unfortunately. So I, I think this goes into metadata. So in duck.json, we should see a bunch of values pop up here. Nope. All right, well, that's good. That's fine. I guess nothing saved. Because maybe they didn't get hooked up properly. or And also, color picker button also did not get hooked up because, you know, you need some logic there. Hold on. Color picker button. What can we connect? Eh, is it color picker created? No. Color, color, color changed. On color picker button color changed, or maybe we can just call it on on color picker color changed because I, I think the color picker button and the color picker, which are two distinct UI elements, share the same signals at least for that. All right, but args. Args, and I'll pass in the color picker button as well. Or color picker button. Hmm. Is there a way to grab the color picker from the color picker button? So you have the color, get the picker, eh, get the picker, get picker. Ah, there we go. Just got to make sure not to, like, yeet it afterwards. Okay. And then we do need to set the initial value of it. So if am, am, cm, aka config manager has data args, then the color picker color is equal to 
Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. A M C M get data args. So that should come to me as, oh, sorry, color picker buton. Yeah, this should come to me as an actual color. It's stored as a JSON, but when we load it into the file, I, um, I unmarshal it. Basically, I serialize it. I don't really, what's the difference between serializing and deserializing versus marshaling, unmarshaling? I think serializing, deserializing, and marshaling, unmarshaling are different terms for the same thing, just different contexts. I've never really thought about it. But I guess marshaling is more of like you're talking about sending data uh, like over a network to another application. So you, if you have like a Java class, you need to marshal it into JSON. Whereas I guess if you have Java data and you want to write it to disk as a <laughs> as bytes, you would serialize it, something like that. I think that makes sense to me. Never thought about that. Probably should think about these kind of things more, but I'm not going to. All right. So, that's not it. Subscribe args, and then we'll pass in Args are, of course, the color picker button. Get picker, I guess. That might be incorrect. I, I need to add a to do. So, to do, maybe connects via the buttons color picker rather than the button itself. Will that be a problem? Question mark. All right, so callback should be on config updated. Yeah, that's probably fine. And here we have on config updated. It's a few things, so there's a button, you know what? No, this should be just the color picker button. And then on color picker, color change. You know what? This should be on the button. It shouldn't be on the color picker. Okay, so we'll take out the to-do. I've already come to a decision. <laughs> How nice. Color picker button, always work off of the button because that's what it's called, yeah. Config updated, so now this is just going to be color picker buton. <laughs> Control color is equal to payload data. I think that's that's fine. Maybe <laughs> I think that's probably fine. Of course, these aren't hooked up to anything anyways. Like they're not, none of these options, like the, if I change the, oh, you know what, really quickly, I need to give a proper name to these as well. So create elements. So scroll container also needs to be called SC name is equal to some sort of light. Or actually, we have the item name, so I should just be using like item name capitalize. Item name capitalize. Or actually all of these should be using item name capitalize. Why am I being weird about it? Yeah. One more time. Once more with feeling. Yeah, so you have your main camera, your main light, main world. How nice. Uh, they don't do anything right now though. Ooh, it's very laggy. Oh, it's because I'm just throwing a bunch of errors. Hmm, <laughs> yep. On color picker, color changed. Yep, okay. So hold on. Color picker, color changed. Color picker, color changed. Color picker, color, color, color picker, 
color changed on what did I connect it to? Color picker button color. Oh, this should also be color picker button. Color picker button color changed. So we can. You know what? Should probably move that out here as well. Say goodbye. Move you. Connects. Blah blah. So connect color picker button, and then we also need to have, uh, what do I call it, on color picker button color changed. Okay. So this has some sort of color, which is a color, wow. Signal name, and then the color picker button. Right, go ahead and return. And then we just need to emit that at some point, right? Uh, so am pub sub publish, ba ba ba, the signal name, color. Yeah. So color picker button not even used, so I'll just underscore it. Yeah, I think that should be okay, maybe. Go here, stage, main world. Uh, yeah, okay, so now I just need to hook them all up to the actual scene objects. I think I can do that pretty quickly though. Although I am curious, does this write anything here? Nope, still not writing anything, which is fine, I suppose. I'll think about it. It's weird, it should be writing that data, but maybe it's not. Am I running into some errors here? No, that's fine. Don't know. Let me see. I think I do connect to a... Nope. Hmm. Maybe I should just add these here. Config specific pub sub values to listen for. Yeah, that's probably fine. I think we can do it here. So this should be a stage. Oh no. <laughs> stage world. What, what was it called? Oh no. Hold on. I think this, oh, okay. I think I, I think I can do this for very specific values. <laughs> I need to come up with a better solution for the all, you know, every single value. There must be a way for me to generate these at runtime. Or maybe I can have like a script that does a little bit of a code injection. So I can generate these externally and then load them in at runtime as well. Uh, so I don't need to, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. Background color though. So this is stage world background color. At the very least, I can listen for this config value. Then here on config changed. We can listen for this value. What am I doing? So main world environment color is equal to payload data. Yeah, something like that. It'll probably work. Let's see. No errors. Okay, well, now we explode. That's good. Invalid set color index color. Mm. Mm. Okay. What? <laughs> what? So it has the it has the data, but it hmm. So the data is the how data size eight, stage world background color is null. Uh, okay. Okay, hold on. I think I can do this. 
where is my default runner? And I set it to a very specific color of green. Or, yeah, so an asset. So I can grab that color. So background, color, grab this value. And then... <laughs> Let's go to globals. So this is just like chroma key green, I suppose. I need, I need a better way of organizing these as well. Because <laughs> right now I'm just kind of placing them wherever I need to place them. Const chroma key green hex. So I'll grab that. Then under, where was my error? Where was the error? This one, yeah. So base layout. So we can set a default. So color from string, which is globals, karma key green hex. Yeah, something like that, right? Or is that going to explode? Uh, it didn't explode yet. No, we have an error. Config value stage world background color is null, but debug key stage world background color not found in model config and metadata creating using default value. Eh, that's fine. And then we go to world. It's not updating, which is unfortunate. Is it even being connected? So this should be intercepted by this one. You set this. Nope. What if we just try to match on the signal name? Nope. Okay. Good to know. So this is not even being intercepted by config changed. Even though I, I feel like that should be, but maybe not. You could also do it here. All right. I also okay. Let's let's put a to do. I need. I think I need to consolidate these two things. Consolidate with um, event published because it is kind of weird how these two kind of coexist, and they do essentially the same thing, right? Except one of them goes via payload and signal name, which is weird, and one of them goes via only payload. Think about that. I'll think about that. Go here, stage, world, blah. We explode. That's good. Invalid set index color on base. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Then this should be main world. Set color in. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. So this should be. Dot background. Back. How do you spell background? Background color. Oh, that's control D, not control Z. All right. OK, cool. All right, it's just that easy. Uh, struggle with it for like <laughs> a few minutes, and then here we go, yeah. Struggle with typing, and uh, now I just need to do that for literally every other object. So that's not a good plan. But for now, it will work. This is actually how this application works. So I probably should not be using the same pattern, because this application was just kind of thrown together as I thought it. I, I added features whenever they made sense to add features, but hmm. Think about it. I wonder if this persists. So we, now we have a very ugly, like toxic green color. Oh, and it is stored in the configuration. That's always fun. Yeah? OK, so it doesn't actually persist to disk, though. I'm not writing it for whatever reason. Oh, it's because we ran into an error. That's why. OK, unhandled signal. That's fine. But we, we, can, we can change it to like a pink. Pink chroma key is also very good. Exit. Yeah, unhandled signal, stage world background color with 
whatever. Now that's from VRM Runner, but I think that's close. Hmm. I think what I will do is I will push the fix for the uh, the tracker persisting after you close the application on Linux. I'll fix that at least today, so we can say that we did something, right? So there's a lot of things that changed. Git restore assets VRM models. We're still working on stage stuff. Open C face GD. Criddle function insert. Nope, that's not it. Is that not it? Oh, that's not insert. So git add. Nope. Nope, that's also not. <laughs> Got this keyboard. Uh, which layer? It's griddle function shift insert. Yes, there we go. I can do things. I just got to get the muscle memory down. So git commit message fix OSF tracker not stopping when the application is when quitting the application when quitting the application on Linux. Yeah, there we go. So we'll just push that straight to master. I think I'm the only one who's allowed to do that, by the way. <laughs> if you are a contributor or even like part of the organization, you have to open a PR. Uh, so after 1.0, I will also be playing by my own rules. But <laughs> for now, you know, he's, he's a wild gun, unpredictable. But yeah. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. I'll be live to what day is today? Thursday? Wednesday. I'll be live tomorrow from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. Working on this again. Uh, if you are interested in the project, you can find it here under VPupper and or Virtual Puppet Project, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's free and open source. There's an alpha out. Uh, we're not quite at the uh, another usable stage. And these changes I've been making are also not present, but uh, they will be. Uh, if you are, you know, if we give the stream a follow, you haven't already. I stream Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and on Wednesdays from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, there is a Discord if you want to chat with me, uh, it, or more like if you have a problem, <laughs> you can come in and ask. I'll do my best to answer in a somewhat timely fashion. fashion. Uh, pretty much all the software I write is also free and open source. I write a bunch of libraries for Godot. Mm, let's find someone to raid. And also after the stream, I'll be pushing my changes onto a branch. So we'll get around to that as well. Let me see. Who Who has been streaming? There's KT, but KT also looks like they're about to bounce. Let me see. Oh no. Stop. <laughs> see ya. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Much appreciated. Let me see. Who is doing Godot? Who is doing Godot? Godot engine. Anybody? So there's someone. There's your Godot in chill. Friendmaster 3000. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, so let's, let's raid them, I suppose. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, give the project a star on GitHub. That's all I'm uh, really in it for, to just stick it to those recruiters. Uh, what else? Give the channel a follow. Join the Discord. Uh, give the program a test. And that's it, yeah. Goodbye, get sense.
really know what they're doing though. <laughs> uh, 